made uh, and, and delivered the ice cream. Well, nobody had ever done that before. <coughs> so I got right in. Got to see the doctor right away. He's examining my eye. Well, I'm, you know, he's eating ice cream. It's terrific. This goes on for about three times. And then on the fourth time, I waited for three and a half hours. And by this time, I'm on a first name basis with him and everybody else. And I said, it's all right, so what gives? I brought you ice cream and you make me wait for three and a half hours. He said, the lady before you brought brownies and I was so full from eating them, I thought I'd better let you wait. <laughs> a bum. <laughs> Donald Trump says, always be nice to your banker because nobody else is. And you're going to need them someday whether you think so or not. So I constantly bring ice cream and ices over to SunTrust. So that, and, and Chase and Bank of America, so that uh, we keep a friendly working relationship. <laughs> Are we uh, live, Ken? Okay, I'm going to introduce uh, Neil Williams to you. Come on up, Neil. Neil is the president of a company. Good morning. Good, Good to morning. see you. Good to see you. Neil's the president of a company called TurnkeyParlor.com. That's uh, T U R N K E Y P A R L O R, TurnkeyParlor.com. Now, when you buy an Emory Thompson batch freezer, we have always sold for 106 years our machines direct because it's a specialized piece of equipment. It needs training like this, and it needs help and assistance, and that's what we do. So we sell them to you direct. Um, the other manufacturers sell everything through master distributors, and uh, that's what Neil is. Uh, he represents uh, Nelson and master built and other companies so all the peripheral equipment that goes into the store the dipping cabinets uh, push carts if you're doing a push cart uh, hardening cabinets all that equipment is bought through a distributor and close your ears for a second uh, what you're looking for is the cheapest paper pusher in the country and this is a very you're not supposed to say cheap inexpensive paper pusher uh, right now, your shirt mind. is going like this. Prices. You're not supposed to wear stripes oh, oh, on stripes camera. Can't it's going like this. You know, <laughs> everybody thinks they got a test pattern. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they'll they'll live. Uh, but uh, Neil has fantastic prices. It doesn't matter where Neil is because it's all shipping out of the factory, uh, wherever the factory is in the United States. Depending on the manufacturer. So what you're looking for is good prices and someone you can get you know, in touch with via email or on the phone. And, and we have worked together for a number of years, and he does a fantastic job. And as you get to know me, you'll find out that I'm a huge Rush Limbaugh fan, and Rush's uh, theory of life is everything is done to make me look good. And you make me look good. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to let you talk about um, push carts, because you've run into the same thing I have, haven't you, that this depression or recession has uh, cause people to lose their jobs and they, they want to keep working and they want to be entrepreneurs. And so they're coming to you uh, to help them sell Italian ice. Yep. So there you go. I'll All right, step thanks. out of the way. All right. So to introduce myself again, Neil Williams and I operate turnkeyparlor.com. And like uh, Steve said, we sell all types of equipment for Italian ice, ice cream, gelato. Um, freezers, carts, uh, hardening cabinets, if you're going to actually make your own ice cream with a batch freezer. Um, and we have, uh, normally, I, I've, when I've come down here before, and first I wanted to say thanks to Steve for, for having this live webcast because it, it helps a lot of people and Steve does it for free. And obviously, you know, we all want to sell equipment and we're trying to help educate whoever we can to, to, to also, you know, for you guys to make money and for us to make money. Um, but um, th there's normally I've talked about wholesaling equipment and, and if you're going to, I mean, a wholesaling product. If you're going to make your own ice cream, how do you wholesale to uh, hotels and restaurants and so on and so forth? And on our website, or if you want to call or email me, I'll send you to some slides on, on some key factors on what you want to do and how you, the, the, the most important thing is making sure that you price it high enough so that if you end up being very successful with your product and you develop a brand, you may at some point start selling to distributors and you want to make sure that you've built enough profit in what your selling price is to let the distributor make a profit and then you can expand your, 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 uh, your product throughout you know, more states. Um, because you're, you're going to want to sell to the distributor and then they have to sell to the restaurant or the hotel or their, the account. So you've got to build in a couple of different um, price structures in there. And, and again, it's, it's a little more detailed than that, and you can call or email me, and I'll, I'll send you the link to, the, to those slides. But Steve asked me to talk mostly about um, 
Italian ice carts and vending out of Italian ice carts. Um, and I, I, I don't know if the camera can see this, but on our website, on turnkeyparlor.com, we've got three free uh, guides. One is about vending out of push carts. And you can see them all on the top left of the site. You just click that link and you'll see three different ones. One for ice cream uh, store vending, one for cart vending, and one for uh, soft serve frozen yogurt. Uh, you know, that's one of the hot concepts right now is the, the machine. So there's three different guides on the website. Um, but specifically, you know, one of the most profitable businesses these days is people making their own Italian ice. Or even, even if they start by buying it and then later you know, invest in, in the machine to make it, uh, you can make some good money. The product cost is low and, and uh, the product is, is popular, especially uh, obviously when it's hotter. Um, but just to kind of go through some key factors, and again, you can download it. It's like a 22, it's free. You can, uh, it's like a 22 page uh, ebook and you can print it out. And um, it's got a lot of good information on the health department and some of the challenges and then the different carts. But just to kind of give you the three basic um, types of push carts, there's what's called the non-refrigerated cart, which is just like a really well-insulated cooler on wheels. Uh, that's the least expensive model. And then there's the refrigerated cart, which if you have access to power, you can keep it plugged in. And then there's a, what's called a cold plate uh, push cart, which you plug it in at night, and then the next day you unplug it, and if you don't have access to power, you can sell up to 12 hours without having to, to need electricity. So that's like, it's the most expensive. It's a little over $3,000 once you get shipping into there. Uh, but it is the most versatile, obviously. You don't have to worry about when, you know, if you go with a non-refrigeration cart, it's the least expensive, but you got to start worrying about when your product is going to start softening and how many sales hours you're actually going to get. And then there's two major categories of carts. There's the smaller push cart, right, where you're just going to be dipping out of a small push cart or selling novelties or something like that. And then there's the larger carts with sinks and dip wells and canopies. You know, you can get into ten, twelve thousand dollar carts when you go there. But those are more for if you're going to be like in a mall or or somewhere more in a fixed location. I mean, you could do events out of these bigger carts with sinks and everything, but you have to have a a way to transport the cart. Um, so, and again, you'll see, if you go to our website, turnkeyparlor.com, and you, you go to the carts, you push the carts link, you'll see push carts and dipping carts, and then you go into the different uh, models and the different types of, uh, of carts. Does anybody have any questions on, on how the carts work or? Neil, how do you keep uh, the cheaper carts or less expensive carts, how do you keep them cold? Um, we do have, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, because we do have now um, for the, there's a, what's called a CLT4NR, non-refrigeration cart. And Nelson has developed these, what are called cool packs, which are like a cold plate. So you, you get from the non-refrigerated cart, it's, it's a little under $1,800 total if you get four cool packs, an umbrella, and the non-refrigerated cart versus the 3000 for the actual real cold plate cart, but you can do the non-refrigerated cart by these little cool packs that are removable. And we've got a video on our website for those, so if you want to look at that. But that's the, the cool packs, you, you know, if you buy a non-refrigerated cart, obviously you have to have a freezer, you know, to keep, to, to bring the cool packs down to temperature and to keep your Italian ices in your stock, right? Um, but it does give you, you know, some of the advantages of using the non-refrigerated cart is that it's lighter, so it's e easier to transport. The, 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 co the real cold plate cart is really the best way to go, except that it's, it's heavy. It's like 360 pounds, so you have to be able to, you know, get that. One person's not going to be able to pick it up and take it somewhere. Two people, you have to have a ramp and get it onto a trailer. But, this, but the non-refrigerated cart is a little easier to deal with, and now we've developed these cool packs that you can pop in there and you'll get a good six hours. It's, you know, plus or minus because you don't know how busy or how hot it's going to be. But to Steve's point and his question was, um, you know, what do you do? How do you deal with a non-refrigerated cart? Well, a lot of people have gone out for years and sold Italian ice straight out of a non-refrigerated cart and just hope for the best as far as how long they're going to be able to scoop for. Um, now with these cool packs, you get a little bit more certainty. You know, it used to be, okay, you get three to seven hours. Now with the cool packs, 
you get a good five to eight hours, you know, uh, where you don't have to worry about damaging the product or, or it being too soft to, to scoop. And how does that work with the, uh, the uh, license bureau, where, um, the health department? Well, it's, you know, I'm very careful about what I, what I personally say about the health department because every, every county, even in the same state, can be a little bit different. Some, some states will say it's Italian ice, it's water-based. And when you go to the health department to ask them, you know, what their requirements are, a key way to try and get permitted the quickest is to say that it's water-based if you're going to do it's a lot harder to get approved for ice cream to scoop ice cream you know they're they're going to hit you probably with a triple bowl sink and you know you're going to get into the more expensive carts there's just no way around it with ice cream it's tough um, with italian ice if you say it's water-based and you say that you're only going to be doing it temporarily you can get a peddler's permit a lot easier and i think in florida they say you know it's the department of agriculture and as long as you, the, the, you, you say, I'm going to use a different scoop for each flavor so that, you're, so that you don't need a dip well to wash your scoop. I'm going to, um, I'm going to be selling temporarily. Um, then you can get a temporary peddler's permit, which I think is the easiest way to get through. But everybody's going to tell you something different. That's the thing that makes it difficult. You really got to you know, go on your own and give it a shot and see what they say. Mainly the question was about the temperature. Um, you're supposed to have a thermometer within your coolers. When Is that what they tell you here? Okay. When yeah. the health department comes around, you always have to have your thermometer uh, in a location. Well, if, if you're using the cool packs in the CLT4 no refrigeration, you should have like a, 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 about a 10 to 15 degree ambient temperature inside the, the, the cart. So you could pop the thermostat, the thermostat in there and have it in there, and you're going to be around 10 to 15. You're going to get a temperature creep throughout the, the day, um, upward, obviously, as it gets warmer and you, you've been opening and closing the, the, the cart. But you can, I mean, you know, it'll, it'll hold that temperature. That's what it's, those car, uh, plates or cool packs are meant to do. And another thing, you know, the, they, they might hit you with a hand washing requirement. And on our blog, if you go to turnkeyparlor.com and you hit the blog and you search under Italian ice, um, we've got a little article that shows uh, an inexpensive way to hit the to satisfy the hand washing requirement, at least in some counties. Um, it's a Coleman hot water, uh, a Coleman propane little uh, hot water heater that you with a with a jug on it with a spigot, and then it's like three hundred dollars. You can buy it on Amazon or eBay and um, it's got a spigot on it, and then you put a five-gallon catch bucket underneath it, you know, on a little table, and, and that's, you know, you have the, the hot water, and, you know, you wash your hands with it. And actually, I learned that from a health department that told me this is, this is the way some, you know, some of your customers can meet the requirements. So that's something to look at. If, if they're telling you everything's fine, but you have to have a way to wash your hands, then that's a way to do it. And you can email me if you can't find that link for whatever reason. Did you have a... Uh, yeah, uh, someone wants to know if, uh, can you temper Italian ice out of the hardening cabinet into a organic serving cabinet? Can repeat the question? Yeah, uh, the question is, can you temper um, the Italian ice out of a hardening cabinet into... Can you, can you temper it, take it out of the hardening cabinet and temper it in the serving cabinet? Yeah, you can. You can you can do that with ice cream. Italian ice, you really don't have to put into a hardening cabinet. It's a little bit different than ice cream. Ice cream, you want to go into the blast freezer hardening cabinet. You're gonna you know get it down to minus 20. It's a it's a minus 40 blast freezer. Um, Italian ice, you really don't need to do that. You don't need to go into a hardening cabinet. You can just pop it in a storage freezer that's zero or below, and then you bring it into your dipping cabinet, and you want your dipping cabinet to be about 10 to 15 degrees. So there's a little bit of play in between there to, to temper the Italian ice, but you do want to store Italian ice around zero. Whereas ice cream, if you're going to store it, you want to store it colder. So tell us a little bit about uh, switching gears to ice cream. Uh, what is a hardening cabinet? What other names does it come after? Why do I need to buy one? Why do I need to buy one? Hardening cabinet, flash freezer, blast freezer. Um, the reason that for ice cream, if you're going to make your own ice cream, you want to have a hardening cabinet or blast freezer is because unlike Italian ice, um, ice cream, when you, as soon as it comes out of the, the, the batch freezer, if you don't 
get it down to zero or below quickly, it'll develop ice crystals and you'll get a grainy icy texture in your ice cream and that's not something that you want. So there's a few extra steps with ice cream versus Italian ice. That's why Italian ice is just an easier product to deal with all across the board. It's less expensive. It's, it's easier to deal with. You don't really need a blast freezer. Um, but obviously, if you want to hit a bigger, broader market, you want to make ice cream too. So um, in that case, you would want a blast freezer or hardening cabinet. And uh, you, know, you, you want to bring it down to temperature fast. You want to harden it fast. And that's so that you don't develop ice crystals in the ice cream. Okay. Any other uh, questions for Neil while he's here? Get him while you can. He's off to the golf course. Did I stay in, did I stay in the frame, Ken? Yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. And um, you're in South Carolina? North Carolina. North Carolina. So if I'm in any other state other than North Carolina and I buy a push cart or a hardening cabinet or something like that, do I have to, and you ship it to me, do I have to pay sales tax? If you're in North Carolina. That's it. But only North Carolina. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't have to pay me sales tax. Okay, so you don't collect sales tax outside of the state of North Carolina. Exactly. Good. And so we ship all across, pretty much all across the world. Canada, the Caribbean a lot, and mostly the United States, but we do ship mm -hmm. all over. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you. And too. we'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, we're going to go on to a cream ice, uh, but before we do, I just wanted to... Uh, talk about something. We've gone through two levels of quality of Italian ice. Uh, I feel that fresh fruit or fresh frozen is the top quality that you can do. And this afternoon you're going to see uh, I'm going to make a Bordeaux wine sorbet and I use uh, some red raspberries, uh, frozen red raspberries I got from Publix and I just opened the bag and put them right in. Uh, to me that's the same as in my scheme of levels of quality. That's the same fresh quality. Uh, the next level down is, uh, and it's not really a level down, but just a more convenient way to get, is using the base, the iRice base, uh, to give you the flavor. And so our food cost went from one and a half cents an ounce for fresh to about one cent per ounce for the base. And this is where people say, that's it, I'm not going any lower, stop right there. And I go, well, what about the kids? Well, what do you mean, what about the kids? Well, kids, don't, kids may want bubblegum Italian ice. How am I going to make bubblegum Italian ice? Well, there's no bubblegum trees growing in Florida or anywhere else that I'm aware of. So the way you make a bubblegum Italian ice is you buy an extract. You're familiar with buying an extract. It's like buying vanilla extract when you bake uh, a pie. Uh, or cake. And um, here we're using an extract. I dropped one of these once. The building smelled of bubblegum for two months. Three months, Ken says. Very, very strong. Uh, to do five gallons of sugar water, we might only be using about two or three ounces of this. So it's super concentrated. Uh, there's a company, there's a bunch of, a couple of companies. There's Edgar A. Weber Company uh, in Wheeling, Illinois, that makes these. And it's excellent. And your recipe is going to be something like seven pounds of sugar, 14 quarts of water, and three ounces of bubblegum extract uh, or watermelon extract. And then there's flavors like cantaloupe and watermelon. You can buy fresh cantaloupe and use it in your ice. And it's going to be quite a challenge to you because cantaloupe doesn't have any flavor. It tastes delicious when you eat it. But if you squeeze a cantaloupe and get all the water out of it, there's nothing left. I mean, there just isn't enough body or solids in there. So often, I'll bolster a cantaloupe ice using a cantaloupe extract or a watermelon extract. By using this bubblegum extract, my food cost drops to half a penny an ounce. So that four ounce portion right here cost me two cents. I mean, it just can't get any more profitable than this. So you can put the money towards maybe a little better push cart. Um, so that's that product, and it's, there's all different flavors that you can do, flavors you haven't even dreamed of. Uh, just a little bit about packaging. I showed you the squeeze cups. Uh, we've been using the foam insulated uh, dishes. Uh, these are two cups from Gelato Supply in Miami. They're nice for gelato. It's just a plastic, and they come in different colors, and you know, containers have come a long way. Keep in mind, though, plastic is going to be more expensive than uh, waxed paper or some of the newer products uh, that aren't, aren't uh, pa paper. They're more of a foam. 
so there's lots of alternatives out there and you just call up your paper supplier or ask around or look around. When I go on vacation, when Paul and I go on vacation, I'm always working. So I'm going into different businesses and I'm seeing what I can find that's new. You know, it's free to go look at somebody else's business. It's not too smart to ask them, you know, do you use an Emory Thompson? Uh, do you use uh, Weber flavors? You know, they're not going to like that because they think you're there to steal their ideas. But, you know, you've got eyes you can look around and, and see. A uh, friend of mine, eco-friendly packaging, uh, it's coming a long way. A friend of mine uh, has the rights to uh, plastic spoons, uh, and they're expanding the line, uh, which uh, they're made out of cane sugar, and they will dissolve in six months. I mean, it's fantastic. Uh, the spoons, I mean, this thing, this thing's going to be around in the landfill till the next century. And... You know, there's always, this is the problem of being in your own business that you have to learn. Spoons were not an issue that I had seen until I was listening to ice cream folks at yahoogroups.com. Again, they don't pay me to do this. I just want you to get the very best of everything. And they were talking about the issue of spoons. And they said, you know, we weren't having any problem last year, but all of a sudden we're starting to have problems that the customer is eating a banana split and the spoon's breaking. And they're getting a sharp edge, and we're afraid of lawsuits. Well, everybody's afraid of lawsuits. So they're finding out what's going on. Well, all of a sudden, a lot of these spoons are coming from China. So it's going to pay you to look for uh, US, made in USA products. I mean, it makes a big difference. We do make better products in the United States nowadays because we have better quality control, number one. We have more regulation. There's no regulation in China about the quality of this spoon or a batch freezer for that manner. Um, so, yeah, Echo Friendly is coming along. Uh, all these things take time, but it's, it's when people ask for it, and they're learning about it. The children are learning about it in school, and they demand it of their parents, and the parents demand it of the ice cream parlors uh, instead of the other way around, but it does get out there, and it will continue to happen, and even faster. Uh, before we make the next flavor, which is going to be a cream ice, I wanted to, I meant to tell you about this earlier. Malcolm Stogo uh, is a world-renowned uh, ice cream, gelato, and sorbet maker. He's written about, I think, three or four books. This is his latest book, Incredible Ice Cream. And I use this when I teach. You'll see on my uh, sheets it says, courtesy of Malcolm Stogo, or adapted is what you'll see from Malcolm Stogo's uh, book. Uh, because sometimes I make the recipes a little bit simpler than he does. But... To me, this is a master's degree in uh, frozen desserts in one book. There isn't one recipe in here. Gramonier ice cream, mint Oreo gelato, um, pineapple water ice, pink lemonade Italian ice. There isn't anything in here that isn't absolutely perfect. And uh, we sell this book. Uh, it's $65 uh, plus shipping. You can also get it at Amazon.com. But otherwise, you call my wife, Paula Thompson. We have in stock. We can ship it out. But I'm not saying it, again, to sell books. I'm saying it because everyone says, where do I get great recipes? Well, manufacturers of flavors are promoting their products. And quite frankly, some of their recipes are a little on the weak side because they don't want to raise the cost up um, too high. Uh, let me give you an example, uh, and this will surprise you. Uh, here's a number 10 tin. This is a standard of the industry, number 10 tin. It's three quarts of flavor. And this is going to say something like use uh, a quart of this to five gallons of finished ice cream. Well, that was written back when ice cream was 10% butter fat or milk fat. Now we run 14, 16, sometimes higher. The higher the fat content, the more flavor you need. So this company should be putting, use two quarts of this flavor to flavor 16% butterfat. But they won't do it because the other guy has got, use one quart on his container and he says, see, use mine. We're more, we're more concentrated. It's not true. It's just the application has changed. So rather than rely on this, this, is, this will give me a baseline of what I need to use, the manufacturer, but Malcolm's book, exactly tells you how it is. And again, I, I take things in here and, um, and, and dumb them down. Like he's got chocolate raisin ice cream. Now right there, that sounds great. 
Chocolate and raisins? I mean, it's raisinettes. What could be better? Uh, peach cobbler ice cream, key lime ice cream. That's going to be a good one in Florida. So anyway, that's uh, something you need to know about. Again, not trying to sell books, but to try to make your batch freezer usage easier. And it doesn't matter whether you have an Emory Thompson, a Taylor, or a Capigiani. Uh, this book uh, is gonna, it's designed uh, for my size machines, but, and the Italians are in liters, but you can, you can adapt it. It's not that hard. Uh, now we're going to make what's called a cream ice. Uh, one of, I said Paula's friend uh, Ralph's in Staten Island is probably the guru of uh, cream ices. I think he makes the best, and I'm going to make a close second of it today. We're going to make uh, was it Oreo cookie cream ice. Cookies and cream. You can't say Oreo cookie. You won't believe this. Man, businesses get so stupid sometimes. Uh, it was in the mid-70s when one of my friends was one of the first. He was in Secaucus, New Jersey. He was probably the first person to make Oreo cookie ice cream. And some mid-management person from uh, Nabisco came in and said, you can't use our name. And so he had to take the, or we're going to sue you for everything you own. So he took the name off and called it Cookies and Cream, or he could have called it Hydrox. Hydrox was saying, please, use our name. But people like uh, Oreo cookies better. Um, Think of all the marketing, the free marketing they could have gotten over the last 30 years if they said, yeah, call it ice Oreo cookie. And Reese's Pieces is called Reese's Pieces ice cream. They realize we're getting free advertising every time they sell a scoop. Uh, that was just ridiculous marketing, and they won't go back on it, and I don't think my ice cream parlors would ever take them back on it. So it's called cookies and cream. Uh, sugar, water, uh, cookies, a little bit of vanilla, just like making an Italian ice, but now we're going to add some of the dairy products. So let me get this put together, and then I'll tell you what I've done. So I've got the three quarts of water and the sugar over here measured out. Let me go off screen for a second. My water. I used to have a table up front here, but then nobody could see what I was doing. And so I'm just adding my sugar. And that recipe is on the uh, website. Oh, by the way, uh, I forgot. We have a series of free DVDs uh, that teach you how to make all these different products. And all you have to do is uh, send us an email at etfreezers at gmail.com, and we'll mail you out the free DVDs. What are there, four of them or three, Ken? Four, four of them for free. And they're going to be like this course. They're going to teach you everything I can think of. There's, there's no script. I just, you know, ramble on and hope that uh, I teach something good. So they're free, give you a good idea of what's going on. Uh, one gentleman in the audience asked to explain single phase versus three phase and air cooled versus water cooled. And we'll get into that right after lunch. Uh, we call it lunch with the president, so we're actually going to feed you lunch. So I've got the sugar and water. Um, and the cookies I've got, I have to go get the ice cream mix and I'll explain what that is. So excuse me one second while I go out to the refrigerator. This is what we call ice cream mix. It's a terrible term. You know, mix sounds like a powder. That's what the Italians do, and we're going to talk about that after lunch. This is nothing more than fresh cream, fresh milk, sugar, and fresh uh, skim milk out of the cow just a few days ago. And it was all blended together in a dairy by dairy scientists. And I don't care how much you tell me, we're always going to have this disagreement that you're going to make a better mix in your home. Well, you don't have six years of master's degree and undergraduate in dairy science to put this together. This changes from month to month depending on what the cows are doing. But people don't uh, recognize that, so they wonder why people say, you know, their ice cream in the spring was better than I remember it this fall. Kiss of death, McDonald's, consistency. Uh, and this is sold by, and, and we're like every industry, Kevin, uh, Kevin, uh, we, are, we talk in uh, 
computer language, bits and bytes and bods, and I don't understand half of it. Well, we do the same thing in ice cream. We call this mix, we uh, rate it by butter fat content. The federal government says if you want to call what you're making ice cream, it must be at least 10% butter fat. Well, there's no, Tom Carvel up in New York used to say, oh, we only use the richest butter in our ice cream. There's no butter in ice cream. It's, it's dairy, it's milk fat. But the term has come along and we call it butter fat. So that's where that came from. And the 10%, um, you see names and why they're so popular, the names, uh, gelato, yogurt, uh, all these different things. It's because there is a federal standard that says anything below 10% has to be called ice milk. Now, unless you're my age, you never heard of ice milk, but think about it, it just sounds cheap, you know, ice milk. Uh, and that's just a federal standard, anything below 10%. So when yogurt first, you know, yogurt's not new. It didn't come out last year in Southern California. It came out in 1975 at a company up in Boston called Bison Foods. And Bison first did frozen yogurt, and then it spread, it was around for 11 years. It died because, uh, the truth came out about it, and it's back again. And it'll be a huge rage for a while, and then the truth will come back out again. The truth is, it's not non-fattening. When someone says it's fat-free, you in a machine, you have to freeze something. Otherwise, you're like the basketball player who forgot the sugar. It's just going to be a giant ice cube. So what do we freeze if we don't freeze fat? We freeze sugar. So it may be fat-free. By the way, my Italian ice, Great buzzwords, fat-free, sodium-free, cholesterol-free. I can even make it all natural. Is it going to put pounds and pounds on you? You bet. It's all sugar. And so is yogurt. And when they say, I mean, yogurt for most of the time had no live culture in it. Uh, so it was only yogurt, yogurt in name. Uh, now some of them do, like Activia, I'm pronouncing that wrong, uh, Activia have live culture in it, but a lot of the products do not. It's advertising hype, and when people start gaining weight because they're eating yogurt, frozen yogurt every single day, you know. Uh, if you ever saw that movie Mean Girls, she, one girl was feeding her friend um, carbohydrate bars and telling her that the more she ate of them, she was going to lose more weight. You know, well, <laughs> that was a mean girl. Um, so this is sold by butterfat content. Uh, Haagen-Dazs and Ben and & Jerry are 16% butterfat. Now, you think, well, gee, that doesn't sound uh, you know, terribly high, but let me show you something. Um, whole milk, you know what whole milk tastes like, and whole milk is 4% milk fat or butterfat, 4%. And you know what it tastes like. Here is what I drink. This is 2% uh, milk fat. Now, that is a world of taste difference between whole milk and reduced fat. Now you get to skim milk, which is close to zero, it's got a whole different taste. It's, it's, like, it's like water. So when we say we went from 10% butterfat ice cream to 12%, we have made a dramatic jump in the flavor content. Uh, uh, 10 to 14, outrageous, 16, unbelievable. Now in New York, it's one thing I learned about being in Florida, and I, I know I'm getting off track, but it's an interesting sidebar. You get New Yorkers coming down here and they're going to open up ice cream parlors in Florida and they wonder why they fail after six months. <clears throat> because in New York we had something what I called the fat wars. If you're selling 12% fat in your store, I'm going to sell 16 so that I can say I'm the richest ice cream in New York uh, because there wasn't anything higher in New York uh, at that time. So I was selling 16% butterfat. You move down here to Florida, you open up an ice cream parlor in Miami and boom, the business fails because you're selling 16% butter fat. What went wrong? The higher the fat content, the more it makes your body sweat. If you go out today and it's 87 degrees and 100% humidity, and you eat a, a steak at Ruth Christ and step outside, you're practically gonna drop dead from the fat that you took in from the Philly Mignon. It just makes you feel awful. It gives you a stomach ache, it's just awful. So my really smart ice cream parlors are selling 10 or 12% butter fat here in Florida because of the heat and the humidity and you get above the Mason-Dixon line then of course Virginia or a little above Virginia Pennsylvania we start getting into the higher fat ice creams so you know, it's, it's like um, that, that uh, nightclub where they said too much is never enough Texas uh, too much can be too much especially in the dairy business so for a cream ice we're 
it's not a sherbet, but it's getting closer to a sherbet. We're basically taking an Italian ice formula, but adding some dairy to it, which is going to really smooth it out. You were mentioning about you know, smooth and coarse. It will make it very smooth to make a cream ice, and that's, that's what we're going to do. And uh, the Italians call it a cremolata. Uh, we just call it a cream ice. So I need uh, 24 ounces of mix. And what do we got here? That's not much. It's, it's not going to be a huge amount. I'm finding out that it's not that people come, are, older people are more interesting. It's just they've been around longer and have more stories. And that's what's happening to me. Great story about this. This used to be sold in pails, uh, you know, really heavy 10-gallon pails. And nobody could lift them. And then uh, there is, oh, up in Boston, um, Hood, HP Hood Mix Company. Big company. Big, biggest dairy up in the Northeast probably. And a salesman comes to HP Hood one day and says, I've got a better way for you to deliver this product. And it's in a bag like this. So he goes to the HP Hood building. Maybe it's four stories high. He climbs up to the top, tells all your executives, get down there. I'm going to give you a live demonstration. I'm going to show you how tough this bag is. That you can drop it, no problem. So from the fourth floor, he hangs out the window and he drops it where all the suits are, you know, Armani suits, the whole works. And that bag just bursts all over everybody. <laughs> they looked at him and said, this is ingenious, we'll take it. Because this was the new way to deliver this beautiful dairy product, was in a bag like this, pre-measured to match one of my larger machines. You just dump the bag in and there you go. But it began its life as a disaster. So we've got the um, sugar. And where did everything go? Right here. The sugar in the water and the mix. So I'm going to start putting this in. You know what, I'm just going to run a quick rinse again through the uh, machine just to get a little bit of the mango flavor out of it. Any questions so far? How am I doing? No, um, not with an Emory Thompson. The question is, is there any difference between cleaning with cold water and warm water? That's a huge question. Um, because if you take this dairy mix and you spill it on the floor, it's like dropping uh, five dozen eggs. You'll be here all day sloshing around dairy fat. And boy, is it slippery. Oh, what a mess. You put cold water into a machine and ask it to clean the machine, and all you get is a big slimy mess of a machine. It doesn't cut through the butter fat. You need hot water to cut through the butter fat. Every manufacturer except Emory Thompson says don't put hot water in your machine. Why? Because you'll ruin the freezing cylinder. But my freezing cylinders are six times thicker than anyone else's. Um, every other machine on the market is Italian. Uh, either Italian in name or owned or are they buying from Italy their machines. So they're taking thin stainless steel and they're stamping it. And you can only stamp this so far because as you stamp a piece of stainless steel, a flat sheet, it gets even thinner. So you end up with a very thin, almost paper thin, freezing cylinder. So don't put nuts in, don't put cookies in, don't put candy in, and God, don't put hot water in. You'll ruin the machine. But Emory Thompson, I take not thin stainless steel like that and stamp it. I take plate stainless steel like you see in the back of a pickup truck, you know, the diamond plate, except mine's flat, it's stainless steel. We actually roll it on a big machine and then we heliarc weld it, weld on the back plate and that becomes the barrel. It's six times thicker than anybody else's barrel in the industry. So we say, hey, anything you want, hot water, uh, nuts, cookies, the works. I do make one caveat about that when I sell it to a restaurant, because restaurants, in my uh, experience, especially in New York, have practically live steam coming out of the pipes. I mean, it, I mean you touch it, it's going to burn you. So my way of working with the machine is 108 degrees you wouldn't even want to shower in. I mean, that's not terribly hot, but it is hot water. But if you can put your hand in it without pulling back in pain, it's fine for the machine. And that's going to cut through the butter fat. 
I'm just going to do one more rinse on that because I just have a little color in here. Um, it'll cut through the butter fat real quick and you know just make your job a whole lot easier. So hot water is definitely important for uh, cleanup. Now again, if this was a vertical cylinder like my grandfather invented, or like Stolting cells, uh, you'd have to use a lot more water. You'd have to fill it all the way up to the top. But with a horizontal Emery Thompson, all you're doing is throwing in any small quantity that you want. There's only a, a gallon that's that much. I don't even think it's that much. Just turn it on, let it slosh all the way around. Uh, how often should the door be removed and disassembled? If I'm talking to the health department, uh, I'm doing it every night, uh, religiously, every piece, examining every piece. If I'm running an ice cream parlor, I'm taking all the parts off and throwing them in the dishwasher and knowing that it's doing a, a fine job. Um, you can never be wrong being overly clean. You're in, the, you're in the food business. I used to give out even more ice cream to my friends in, uh, it, when our factory was in the Bronx, New York. And my greatest fear was to pick up the New York Times the next morning and read you know, 16 people dead of food poisoning in Rye, New York. Oh. You know, I didn't want to ever see that. So you can never be too clean. I have a question. Yes. The question is, can you make a smaller batch than, it's actually a six quart machine. Okay. Uh, the minimum that you can put into this machine is six, uh, three quarts, uh, because otherwise you don't have enough product to splash around the walls. On the bigger machines, whatever they're rated, you can do a half batch. It, will take ha it won't take half the amount of time. It'll take less time, but not half. So not only the timer, you've got to watch it like a hawk, because it's going to be ready sooner. Uh, the question is, the more batches you make, do you have to clean out more often because of parts on, uh, mix ice cream ices stuck on the parts? No. Uh, when you first make a batch, you'll get a little on the front door, a little on the other parts, and then that's it. In this machine, it's going to be less than half a pint. And uh, from then on, if you make one batch or 30 batches, it's always going to be the same. The parts will already have been coated with a little bit of ice cream or ices, and so everything else is going to come out. So. My first batch might be five and three quarters return. My second batch is going to be six quarts. My 15th batch is going to be six quarts. And on freezing time, if my first batch took, say, 10 minutes, my second batch might take nine minutes because the machine's cold. My 20th batch is also going to take nine minutes. In there somewhere, if I dump in some water, I'm back to 10 minutes because I've warmed the machine up. But no, you, you don't have to rinse out. Uh, people like Ralphs run these things 18, 20 hours a day, nonstop. And that's what they're designed to do. We're in every country in the world. There's not a country or a major city that we're not in. And most places, labor isn't as expensive as the United States. So instead of running five of these, they'll run one or two and run them 24 hours a day seven days a week. That's not uncommon for our machine. So I've got the sugar and the water in there. Now I need the ice cream mix. I have not tasted this formula, so I don't know what we're going to get. We'll find out. Um, and a little bit of vanilla. I use... Uh, Lockhead or Nielsen Massey. They're both family businesses and they're both American. Uh, this is Lockhead and it's, it's wonderful stuff and the people over at Nielsen Massey are a great uh, product too. E equally as good. So it calls for about one ounce and that's about that. Now again, I'm breaking my own rules. I should have measured that because if I'm doing this and you had it three years ago, it should be exactly the same. Uh, so we've got everything in there. We'll turn it on. 
Now, on these Italian ices, I'm running them at full speed because uh, with, with dairy product, with uh, regular ice cream that we're going to make after lunch, uh, we can adjust the amount of air. With sugar and water, if you take uh, the mango formula and put it in the ice cube trays and throw it in the freezer, it'll expand 17%. That's the normal expansion of water. You know how the ice cubes crown over if you still have ice cube trays? That's all it'll expand. I mean, the machine will add a marginal amount, but not much. So for the most part, what you put in with Italian ice is what you get out. On this one, we might get a little more because we have thrown some dairy in, but I'm still not going to you know, vary the speed that much. I'm coming there. This is the best part. This is where the recipe is. There are exactly three cookies reserved for the ice cream maker. So, uh, and you won't mess up the recipe. I, so I already ate my three last night. This is the greatest invention that was ever made. The, the pullback, because Paula doesn't know that this is sitting up on the shelf, you know, with some other stuff. And <coughs> three, three months ago, maybe, I peeled it back. I had my cookies and put it back. I love it. And Hydrox just doesn't cut it. It's not the same. So I'm going to add these right while the machine's running. It does spit a little bit sometimes. You can't do this with any other machine. The, the openings aren't big enough, and they'll void your warranty. Because the machine's going to do it. Now, when I'm making ice cream, good point. Let me just keep getting some of these in. Um, <coughs> this will grind them up. And if I was blindfolded, if you were blindfolded, and I said, here, taste that, taste that product. What's it taste like? Oh, that's Oreo. I can taste it. You take the blindfold off, you don't see any Oreo cookies. So I call that the fruit flavor and fruit identity, two terms I came up with. Even though they're cookies, we'll call it fruit. My fruit is going into the machine, that's my Oreo cookies to give me my flavor, but I don't see any. So while that's running, I'm gonna break it into four pieces, and if I was making ice cream, I'd open up the gate, not all the way, but halfway, and I would just shake my pieces. Now I've got my identity. I can see, oh yeah, I see, that's Oreo cookie. Uh, commercial ice cream. When you buy Haagen-Dazs nowadays, it's made on a commercial freezer, thousand gallons an hour, the machine can only make vanilla or coffee extract. Everything else is added by a $40,000 machine called a fruit feeder. It's out here and it's injecting strawberries, it's injecting cookies into the finished ice cream. So technically the difference between, um, let me just try something. That nah, didn't make any difference. Um, I slowed it down a little bit. Um, the difference between commercial ice cream and homemade ice cream. Uh, commercial ice cream will always be vanilla ice cream with strawberries injected into it. That's strawberry ice cream. Homemade ice cream where on an Emory Thompson where you can put the strawberries right in. For every particle of vanilla mix, there's a particle of cookie or strawberry right next to it. So my taste is going to be more intense than what you can do on a Capigiani or a Taylor or a continuous freezer because they can't put anything into the barrel. So it's a huge advantage taste-wise. It's also very convenient. Now again, cookies are sugar. So the freezing time is going to be longer because we've added more sugar to the recipe. Another reason not to put an automatic timer on the machine, you know, the other companies say, oh, buy our machine, it's so automatic. No, it didn't. You've got to keep going back and start it up again because the Oreo cookie takes longer than the vanilla because the Oreo cookie, they refuse to admit that cookies are sugar and they're adding more sugar to the recipe. Let me just rinse my hands off here. Yeah, 
Keep what? Checking it this, this I always keep checking the product to see how it's doing. Because I'd, I'd prefer not to freeze up. I mean, my customers, when they're new at this, they freeze up the machine all the time. Uh, and they shouldn't. It's just a matter if you walked away from it, you got talking on the phone. No, you're here to make ice cream. You should lock the door and just say, go away. You know, it isn't going to make any difference on sugar water because uh, it's not going to take on a lot of air. But yeah, I can. It'll actually freeze faster at a higher speed than a low speed. Uh, the electric on this is 220 volt, what's called single phase. Let's, let's talk about that while it's running. Um, there's there's uh, a bunch of different powers in the United States. Not a lot, but your light bulbs are, uh, one, you call it 110. It's actually 115. So let's call it 110 light bulb. That's light bulb power, and you got that in your house. Then you have your central air conditioning system in your house and your clothes dryer, if it's electric, those are 220 volt. They're heavier. They're twice as heavy as this. Uh, this is one uh, line of 110 volt. Your 220 is two lines of 110 volt to make 220, heavier power. This runs on heavier power. So wherever your clothes dryer is, this could run. Now, where it gets complicated is there is then single phase and three phase. Single phase is all across the United States of America. It's in every community. That's what's in your house. When you buy 200 amps of service for a new home, it's 200 amps of single phase power. And then everything divides it up. This takes 20 amps. That takes 15 amps. Uh, that thing takes 12 amps until you get to your, all your amp usage if you were to run them all at the same time. That's single phase power. Here in this factory, I need a lot more power for all the machinery that's out there that you'll see later on. And so they deliver to me 220 voltage, but three phase. Instead of two wires of 220, it's three wires. It's more power over the same lines. Now, the problem is three phase is only available here in the park. In your home, there's no three phase. In, in, in your town, on your main street, they used to put in three phase for you, but nobody's using it, so it costs too much, $40,000. They just say, no, we're not going to do it for you. So what do the Italians do? You know, Taylor, uh, uh, Stolting, Capigiani, Electrofreeze, they're building the machines in Italy, or final assembling them over here, and they are three phase power, because that's what all of Italy, all of Europe is three phase, no single phase. So they bring it over here and they say, okay, you want this machine? Fine. Here's the price. Oh, by the way, you need a $2,000 transformer to make it work in the United States. My personal feeling, because we are so arrogant uh, as foreigners that we're not going to build to you puny Americans. You're going to take what we offer you. So you buy it that way and you buy the transformer if you want us. And now you've got a machine that if you decide to retire in five years, you can only sell it to someone who also has three-phase power. I build my machines handmade from the ground up. So we build according to your order, single phase or three-phase, air or water. So this one is single phase, and that means I can run this in my living room. I can run it in Canada. I can run it in Mexico. I can run it anywhere in North America. I can run it in my garage. So that means I could sell it to anyone. Uh, so it's got much higher resale, even forgetting that it's an Emory Thompson. Uh, it has a higher resale just because it's single phase power. Now, air cooled versus water cooled. Um, did I leave my, yeah, I'm losing my voice. Let me just grab a sip. This has an engine in it. We call it the compressor or the whole package is called the condensing unit. Your home refrigerator has a teeny tiny condensing unit in it, about an eighth horsepower, one eighth, if that big. And it's air cooled. Your refrigerator is sucking air in from the bottom and blowing it out the back so you don't even know what's happening. It's an air, your refrigerator is an air cooled unit. Uh, this is an air cooled unit. This one is sucking air in from the back 
and blowing it out the sides. That's how we're cooling the engine. We have a fan in there and it's blowing cool air or the room temperature air across the compressor. A water-cooled unit, which this is, doesn't have any air, doesn't have any fans. It's taking in cold water, cold city tap water, only when the compressor's on. Only when that switch goes on is that using water. When it's off, no water. And uh, that water is circulating around the engine and cooling it. And then that water is thrown away. It goes out to the drain at 108 degrees. That water has gone through all copper lines. Paula's in my house up in Pelham, New York, was so old it had lead lines. The water coming out of this machine is cleaner than what we used to drink at our house in Pelham. Um, and you could drink it, but you're not going to, but there's no reason, you see me go over there, no reason I can't wash utensils with it or buckets. So I'm getting extra duty out of the water. I'm using it twice. Now you say, oh, you're wasting water. It's bad for the environment. Yeah, it is. But look at it this way. We're in Florida. This room is set at 76 degrees right now. It's been, or 75. It's been maintaining that all day long. This thing's cranking out some hot air. This baby would crank out twice as much of hot air and then four times and six times on the bigger machines. That means that in order to maintain 75 in this room, the air conditioning unit out back has got to burn like crazy to cool this room. And that air conditioner outside is using electricity, which is ultimately what? Fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is going up much faster in price than water. Water is expensive. Yes, I know you're paying uh, sewer charges too, but look at your water bill. It hasn't really changed much in the past year. Your electric bill has probably gone up 30% in the last year. And next year, your water bill probably won't change that much, but your electric bill is going to go through the roof. So you're either going to burn fossil fuel to run any machinery in this building, or you're going to use water. It's, it's one or the other. So how do you decide? Depends on the location. Guy up in Minnesota said, please, please, give me air cold. It's 40 below here in winter, and I can get free heat in my ice cream room. Perfect. Um, down here, I want water cooled. Uh, Los Angeles, we have water restrictions because they have, you know, you always see the, you know, cops and robbers shows where they're, you know, driving through those cisterns. That's supposed to be carrying water. Every time the cops are going through it, it's empty. Water restrictions in Southern California, you use air cooled. You're on the island of Jamaica, they have a lot of wells, use water cooled. You're on the island of Anguilla, they don't have water, use air cooled. So it boils down to your personal location, which one you buy. And I've been ignoring this, so let's take a look. Oh, that's nice. Turned off the refrigeration. I don't know how well you can see that. But that's just pouring out. How about that? And again, that timer was six bucks. Is there a difference in the life of the machinery air versus water? Not with us, because we've been building air cooled for as many years as we've been in existence. We know how to size the compressors and the ones that we buy to match what we need to do. Over in the back, the people in the audience can't see it, but that's a 24 quart batch freezer with a 70 gallon hardener that goes to 30 below that I built for the United States Marine Corps. They're over in Afghanistan, they're in Iraq, making this product for the troops. And that thing is designed to, if I shut the power off on it, it, the product won't melt for at least 24 hours. It's also designed to be dropped out of a uh, cargo aircraft with uh, three parachutes, land on the ground, and immediately run. And the instruction book, which cost $17,000, courtesy of the federal government, uh, shows particular points in it where to put C4 to blow the damn thing up. Uh, if it ever falls into enemy hands. I figure, what could be better detente than to give them an ice cream machine? <laughs> you know, come on. But, you know, the joys, of, the joys of the government. So, there's our Oreo cookie Italian ice. I'll bet you it's good. We're going to find out, and then we're going to have lunch. So, let me go get the cups again.
and I can turn this off and we'll see if this is any good. Again, I've never made this one, so we'll see. Uh, I need more of these, so excuse me one second. I'll be right back. Hmm? No, no, no. Give you fresh. We'll be done, and we're just having the ice. Where did these go? They were here. Oh, can you show me? Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be done in five minutes. Okay. Here's our office manager, Paula. If you're interested in that book, she handles that. Oh, right there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And she also shows me where everything is. <laughs> Paula, you can try this first. I've never made this, so you can give me a, okay. uh, a th thumbs up or thumbs down. This is um, Oreo. Oreo cookie Italian ice, oh. uh, a la Ralph's. All right, I will. Uh, can you grab a spoon and give me a, a read on this before I give it to them? Thumbs up. Okay. Good. Come on up and get it. It's good? Okay. Here's the uh, spoon. Oh, okay. There you go. I'm telling you, by 2 o'clock, you're going to be saying, please, no more. I can't take it. <laughs> Whoops. Well, you don't have to eat it all. It's the funniest thing doing trade shows. You're giving away ice cream. You've got a line of people, and they come up to you and say, oh, I only want half that much. I go, lady, it's for free. But I understand that, and in fact, I, I tell people that we have this argument on ice cream folks once in a while. Uh, should we give um, a half scoop or children's size to seniors? And, you know, they say, no, it's designed for children. Well, uh, people just don't always want that much product. And so if you say no, because they ought to be buying a full scoop, you're passing up $1.50 that you didn't have in your pocket before. So why not give it to them? Why not give people what they want? <laughs> is it good? Here you go. Yeah, take it with over there to look. All right, I'm going to try it. See, I wait to see if it kills all of you, and then I try it. Oh wow, Ken, you got to try some of this. I'll bring it to you. All right. See, Ken's from the old school. He wants it in a squeeze cup. And then you have those little bits and pieces. Of Oreo. Isn't that great? See, you can't do that with other machines because you can't throw the product in. This would have been a different color. This would have been white, and we'd be throwing cookies in. It's just not the same. Wow, that's good. Now, if you want to keep more identity, you could just add them in later? Yes. You would take, you would put, if you wanted to keep the identity, you would put half your cookies in the machine and the other half snap each cookie and then break them up and throw them in later. And then you've got what I said, the fruit flavor and the fruit identity. You're blindfolded. You can certainly taste that and say, yeah, that's Oreo cookie. But you look at it and you don't see, I don't think we showed the audience, you don't see any Oreo cookies in there. You sure do taste them. So we've got the flavor, but we don't have the identity. The identity would be adding them as it came out. Yes, you do. You've got some pieces in here. Mm-hmm. Well, that's actually a new blade system that we put into effect about five years ago, and it doesn't quite beat up the product as much as it used to. So it really works well. Since you added cream, you have to be more careful with it, letting it melt down and refreeze. Well, I would never let a dairy product melt down and refreeze. Um, Italian ice, theoretically, if you didn't sell it, you could melt it down and reprocess it through the machine. But really, I mean, the, the tub costs you three bucks, and you're going to risk your customers by giving them a reprocessed product. I, I just don't like it. I throw it out, um, and, and I study why did, it, why did it not sell. I mean, did a monsoon come through at 2 in the afternoon, and I couldn't do anything about it? Or is it a flavor people just don't like? I love it, but you don't, and so it's not selling. Uh, or did I just plain make more of it than I possibly thought I could sell? So don't just say, oh, I'm going to re refreeze it and give it to the customer. 
ask yourself why it didn't sell. You know, sometimes the best decision is to not sell something, take it off the market. If it's dairy product, I never redo it. Um, You can put it back in the freezer. That's not a problem. Not at all. You said it all depends on the events. If you're going to do an event, like say a night event where there's more adults, I don't think you would want to use this. But if you're going to do an event where there's kids, you would probably want to do an Oreo ice. Yeah, did you all hear that? that he was saying that uh, this product, and I'm going to talk about that for a second. Uh, if you were doing a nighttime event, uh, this may not sell to the adults as much as it would to children, though. I don't know. It's pretty good. Uh, but it would definitely be more, certainly bubblegum is a good example. You're not going to sell bubblegum to adults at night. Yeah. Uh, champagne sorbet, absolutely. Yes. And we're going to make a uh, Bordeaux wine sorbet as the last product this afternoon, which will knock your socks off. It's great. Yes, it would. A kid's event would be great. Let me tell you a little bit about Italian ice. And I, you know, I tread carefully, but, you know, forgive me. Uh, if three people walk into my office and I have to guess what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, I can't do it. Uh, I have no idea what you like. But if three people walk in and they're of different backgrounds, I can pretty much tell you what flavor there is going to sell. If they're black, it's going to be cherry or grape or watermelon. If they're Jewish, it's going to be chocolate. If they're Italian, it's going to be lemon. If they're Hispanic, it's going to be a coconut flavor. And it, it just holds true all the time. And what that does for me, unlike ice cream, is I can look at a market. I can say, OK, Harlem. Uh, we're sure not going to sell chocolate up in Harlem today. Uh, or in South uh, Central Los Angeles, we're probably going to sell more of the coconut flavors. Um, I'm a Presbyterian. We form a committee to make a decision for us. That's all we know to do. Uh, lemon, lemon is so Italian that when they go in to buy, when Italian goes into a pastry shop to buy a cherry Italian ice, he gets, says, give me a cherry lemon ice. Give me a grape lemon ice. Lemon ice is the generic term. Uh, just like in Philadelphia, they call it water ice. And that is a huge advantage because you can look at your market with Italian ice or sorbet and say, oh, this is what's going to sell. Don't bother taking bubble gum Italian ice to a fine French restaurant. They're never going to buy it. You either have a question or you have to go to the bathroom? Uh, both. Okay. They're still confused about the difference between uh, single phase and three phase. So am I. Uh, still confused about single phase or three phase. Again, single phase is what <clears throat> is all over the United States. It's 220 volt, it's two wires, and it's what's here. It's, it's in the box back here. Three phase is what's in my factory because I'm using a lot more power. You're buying 100 amps of service for your house. I have 6,000 amps of service for my factory, way bigger than you have. Uh, but I'm using more power to build these machines. And so to deliver me more power, the power company says, we're going to bring him 220 volt, three phase power. Uh, you don't have the choice. If you've got a little store, uh, up in Northport, Long Island, and there's no three-phase in the building, they're not going to give it to you. You're out of luck. So if you buy a Capigiani three-phase machine, you have to then buy, on top of the $30,000 machine, we're, we're way cheaper, uh, you also have to buy a $2,500 transformer to run the machine. You have to wire the transformer to the box, wire the machine to the box, and then it'll run. And guess what? Those boxes at 2,500 bucks, they burn out after about five years on average. I know somebody's going to call me and contest it, but I can give you more stories about them burning out than you can give me about them lasting 100 years. It doesn't happen. So three phase is going to cost you, and you can't get it. Uh, is there an uh, operating advantage of one over the other? No. Uh, three phase and single phase are the same power. I know Gary up in Chelmsford is rolling his eyes over this one, but it's true. They operate the same. Getting too technical, but to satisfy Gary, a single phase machine does have two extra little electrical parts called a run and start capacitor. And maybe after 10 or 15 years for 80 bucks, you'd have to replace them. They actually start up the machine, like a battery starts your car. Uh, but that's the difference. So unless you'd like, like some more ice cream right now, we're going to break and have lunch. 
and then we'll come back and let, let me see what we're doing after lunch. We're, we're going to go to the bigger machine and we're going to make uh, ice cream. What are we making? Oh, gelato, yeah. Oh boy, do I have a lot to say about gelato. Okay, fasten your seat belts, it's going to get bumpy. Uh, our machines make better gelato than anybody, and I'm going to tell you why I don't like gelato. Uh, but uh, you know, you'll agree with me by the time I'm finished. So, uh, if you'll pot down my mic, Ken, we'll 